So welcome back and welcome to this week's episode of the Divorce Recovery Show with Diane Valleycat and our special guest, Tara Sly. So Diane Valleycat's Ottawa's local divorce recovery coach, and she works out of the Separation Divorce Resource Center, which she founded. And, and Tara, who is a child and youth worker, and she's been in the, you know, helping kids uh, navigate the worlds of divorced families for over 10 years. And we're going to hear more about sort of the impact and the horror stories of parental alienation, but from the children's perspective. So welcome. Please just sort of tell us a little bit more about what you do, more specifically on the parental alienation. Tara. Hello. Um, thanks for having me. So essentially what I do um, is I work with kids who are going through separation and divorce. So whether that means they're struggling with it or um, parents are noticing signs of behavior changes, all kinds of things like that. So unfortunately, through my time of doing that, I've come across quite a few cases of parental alienation. And so um, it's definitely something that I wanted to speak on um, because I feel like not a lot of people talk about it. And it's something that needs to be talked about because in my perspective, it is a form of child abuse, denying one child a parent for many times not very good reasons is unfair to their lives. And a lot of people don't realize the domino effect that it has on a child to not have a parent in their life um, because of parental conflict. So yeah, that's what I do. Um, have you, hi Tara. Uh, Tara and I have been working together for 10 years. And what I do is I deal with the parents and she um, does deals with all the children and she's done some custody and access and some you know, reports on alienation for the judges and for clients. I know your hands are tied when it comes to a lot of this. And what is it that parents can do in order to stop, like, kind of help the parents stop having to continuously fight with each other? Is that, you know, can the court courts do something about this? Essentially, they can, but it is really difficult, especially for the parent who is being, being alienated, because essentially it's just a constant it's a constant battle. It's a constant fight. They just have to keep returning and returning because every time the parent who is doing, doing the alienating always comes up with new tricks or new ways or, or this and that, and then they end up back in the courtroom. And the unfortunate part about that is a lot of time the judges and everybody's hands are kind of tied because of the court process, right? Everyone's do their process, but it kind of snowballs. And then eventually, you know, one parent is left with either the resources are diminished and they can't continue fighting or they just don't have it in them anymore to keep going. And so those are essentially really unfortunate cases. So the only thing that you can do is to just keep keep at it and keep fighting. So that way you don't completely lose all contact and all connection with that child so that ultimately one day they can see what's been going on and they can get an idea of what's been happening and hopefully make that connection with the parent who's been alienated. Um, I often ask parents or say to parents, you know, you can go ask for the office of the children's lawyer. And so maybe explain a little bit about that. Yeah. So the Office of the Children's Lawyer is a really great resource when it comes to cases where there is custody um, and access arguments. A lot of people don't actually know about them and, you know, and the benefit of having them. So when I'm dealing with kids and I'm going through these kinds of processes, there's not much that I can do as far as legalities go. Children's Aid isn't equipped to deal with this type of situation, and it's not a child protection issue. Yeah, so there's not much that they can do, right? They can't, they can't change access, they can't change court orders, all of that kind of stuff. There's nothing really that they can do. So the Office of the Children's Lawyer um, is an agency basically where your lawyer would ask for the Office of the Children's Lawyer to be appointed to your case. And then once the Office of the Children's Lawyer is appointed to your case, your children are assigned a social worker and a lawyer who works on their behalf. And those people go around and interview all everybody involved in the child's life. So it could be um, teachers, you know, therapists, anybody who's, you know, had some contact with the children. And from there, they make a recommendation to the court based off of their findings. So um, they really tend to take the children's best interest into mind, which is a really great thing because it leaves the two lawyers out of it. It leaves um, the parents out of it. And it really only looks at what is in the best interest of the children. Um, 
the difficult part about that with parental alienation is a lot of times children have been convinced that one parent is bad. So what they report to the office of the children's lawyer is, mm -hmm. is what's being repeated back to them, right? And so that's the difficult part is you really need a good team to be able to wade through that and really see what is actually going on. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you, I know that you've had, you know, some clients or children um, that you've had that you started to do, you know, you counsel and that you um, have them, you know, every week. And what is it that you work on for those kids who are in, in the midst of, you know, being convinced that the other parent is not okay? What does the kids say? Like, what, how does it happen in your, in your office? Um, those are really difficult cases for me because kids become really emotional, right? So essentially what's happening is, is children are made up of two people. And when they're being convinced or told that one parent is bad, essentially what you're doing is telling them that half of them is bad. And so what a lot of times happens and parents don't really recognize it and the children don't really recognize it is that they're internalizing it and they're making it about them and they're making, they're owning it which is then going to play out for the rest of their lives. So I really try and challenge thinking and really try and open up their minds to the possibilities of what is going on so that they can hopefully in the future not own this and walk this as if this is their truth, right? So essentially my job is to help support them through it and to help, you know, build self-esteem and help to make them feel good about themselves so that they can hopefully make their own decisions and see, mm -hmm. you know, what is actually happening. Like you had a case, I know not long ago where the little girl's like 14 and mom is convincing her the dad's really bad. And yet she would come into your office and like, just cry the minute she walked in saying, you know, my mom wants me to hate my dad, but I don't, and I don't know how to be. So what do you do with that? Those are situations where I do try and I try to involve the parent um, in the conversation the best that I can. So that way, you know, especially in a situation like that and trying to explain to one parent that their hate for the other parent isn't fair. And it's not that child's responsibility to feel that hate with them or for them. Um, so, yeah, I, I do have that a lot where there is you know, a child feeling like they can't be open with one parent or they can't love one parent the way that they want to. Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times it is mothers who tend to mm -hmm. be a little bit more manipulative in that sense and, and to have hate and to um, alienate. And in my experience, um, and, you know, dads are kind of left wading through the court system and trying to figure it all out. And a lot of times have a lot of difficulty uh, but yeah, so in situations like that, I do try and involve the parent. If that's not something that's feasible or they're unwilling to hear me, then, you know, at that point, my job is to support that child and make sure, you know, that they understand that they are free to love their parents, regardless of what the other parent feels or has to say about it and how to really build their self-confidence and their self-esteem so that they feel that they are free to do that. But are they really ever free, right? So I think they hide their feelings and they hide, you know, that, that they do want or like dad and they can't kind of say it because when they come home and if they say stuff like that, then mom goes crazy and just makes it so much harder for them, which is a really oh, yeah. sad thing, right? Oh, yeah. Um, a lot of times it, it's, it's really difficult when, you know, when there's any kind of parental conflict, the children don't know where to be, what to do, who to say, like what to say, who to believe you know, all these kinds of things. And, and, you know, I have clients who are struggling with, do I believe this story? Do I believe that story? And they mm -hmm. have no clue where they fall in all of this. And their life is completely consumed by parental conflict. And that's not fair. You know, mm -hmm. at eight, mm -hmm. nine, 10, they should be going to camp and mm -hmm. enjoying their summer instead of worrying about, you know, how to please their parents and how to make their parents not argue and all this kind of stuff. You know, it's, it gets, really intense. But I think it's a little bit more intense. I mean, we, next week we'll cover some of the conflicts that you see. And, you know, so I'm, we're going to talk about a particular case that, you know, there's no alienation, but there's so much conflict that the poor child is just, you know, doesn't even know how to be anymore. 
But I think more in alienation, it's almost like just never stop fighting. Right? Yeah. Maybe never stop yeah. writing emails or, or texting through Facebook if they're old enough or sending letters, sending cards, whatever it is. So that later on, I think when the child turns 16, 17, can go to that parent and say, you know, why didn't you fight for me? So the other parent can say, well, actually I did. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a matter of just keep trying, just keep going. You know, um, we've had cases that have been in court for eight years, nine years. And, you know, parents just got to keep fighting so that, you know, that eventually you can get to the where you want to be and you can get contact with that child. Um, I know it's not always easy and it's, you know, definitely easier mm. said than done, but it's, you know, it's really the only way to battle through it currently. And the sad part about it is that let's say, you know, dad, mom hasn't been able to see their kids for seven years, you know, and when they reconnect, they've lost all of this time. And so yeah. usually it backfires back on the parent who did the alienation and a lot of all times the child will go, you know, full circle and go live with, let's say it was mom, go live with dad and want nothing to do with mom. Right. So again, that there's a, there's a double loss again. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And it's just, you know, we've had kids, uh, we've had a situation where there was a child who was two years old and mm-hmm. all these accusations had been made towards dad. He had a great job. He was a great parent. He ended up in supervisor access and you know, it took him two years to fight in the courts and go through psyche valves and all kinds of stuff, you know, but ultimately he was able to get enough evidence and get enough behind him that mm. he, you know, he was able to gain access to his child unsupervised and, you know, um, with a plan to reach 50 50. And that's really the only way to go about it, you know, is to keep pushing and to keep you know, doing what the court has asked you and, and, you know, take the courses, get the psyche valves, do all these things so that when the time comes, you're prepared and you have what you need. The thing is, is that, you know, a trial costs over thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 and, you know, all the settlements and the case conferences and the case settlements, you know, before you even get to a trial. And oftentimes, you know, this, this dad, as we know, has the money to pay for it. And oftentimes the, uh, the parent doesn't like, you just, you just, bust, right? There's yeah. no money yeah. and no one will help you. Legal aid won't help you because you make too much money, um, you know, and the lawyers want to get paid. Yes, they'll put you on some kind of payment plan, but the payment plans are big. And sometimes yeah. they just, they just can't keep, they just can't keep fighting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and that's usually really one of the most unfortunate parts about it is that the court system isn't quick to pick up on these kinds of cases, right? Because, um, usually the parent who's doing the alienating is so good at it and they're so good at telling stories and they're so good at convincing their child and convincing people around them that mm-hmm. the other parent is so bad and so unsafe and all these kinds of things. And they'll, they'll use anything out of the, you know, woodworks that they can think of, you know, from mm-hmm. allegations of abuse to, you know, Sexual calling assault. the police and, yeah. you know, unfortunately a lot of times, especially when it comes to dads, not only are they fighting a family court battle, but they've also had numerous charges pressed against them. So they're also having to go through a criminal court system, you know? Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. that's also one of the most unfortunate parts about it, because now you have to have a criminal lawyer, family law lawyer, and it's just, it's a lot for people to handle when, those kinds of situations are coming up and mm-hmm. the court doesn't offer any kind of, you know, help really, because it's the process. This is how it has to be done. And, mm-hmm. and it definitely leaves a lot of people behind. Mm-hmm. In your opinion, what could family court do differently? Can they should, should my, my opinion was that like get a panel, a special panel, a special, um, special lawyers, special, you know, people who have been working in this, and those cases need to show up on, you know, with the with the ex- experts so that they can just really call it like it is versus going to case conference, case settlement, you know, and all that kind of stuff in the interim. Like you just said, it takes a year to get through all of this. Well, that year he's not seeing his children. Right. Yeah. He's not. Seeing I think that me- I think mediation should be mandatory mm-hmm. um, because before any kind of case conference, anything like that, because I feel like that's one of the best ways to um try to come to some sort of negotiation or some sort of uh you know and then you can see who just wants to fight and who actually wants to make it this work um i also think that 50 50 custody should just be a standard unless you can prove otherwise Mm -hmm. um because i don't understand why dads don't have the equal rights that moms have Mm -hmm. um 
because they're just as important in a child's life. They're not the same. They're not, you know, they're not as nurturing as moms or whatever the case might be, but they have their perks and they have their needs in their child's life. And so and they their should value. Be offered. Yeah, they're and huge and value. Their value. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a huge value. And I think that, you know, they should be given equal rights right off the bat unless somebody can prove otherwise on why it shouldn't be that way. Mm-hmm. And um, and the panel. I know that some states do that where yeah. before you even get to see a judge, you go in and you have a panel and you present your case and you and you put it out there as if you are in court. And that panel is made up of mediators, lawyers um, and a psychologist, psychologist and they come together and they see what you have to say and then they make a recommendation and to me that right off the bat you would have a recommendation and right off the bat you would have people who are on top of it opposed to doing it completely the opposite yeah, way i agree and yeah yeah so i think those it would be a start all right thank you tara um i think we're going to talk about a bit um next week tara's going to actually go through a case which is not parent alienation, but it's just a nonstop fighting and arguing and um, kind of explain the outcome of what this poor little kid went through. Um, so thank you, Tara. Um, thank Tara's going to start Tara's going to start doing a course where we're looking at doing a parenting through divorce. And if anybody's interested, just write yes in the comments and we'll contact you probably. This will happen about middle of September. And I am starting a workshop on rebuilding when your relationship ends at the end of August and in the next three weeks will be more about children going through the divorce. And then I will come back and explain what this workshop is all about. Thank you. Hope to see you next week.